This is Make It Plain. Make It Plain. M I P. With my Samela Matsumo. Mark Thompson. Make It Plain. Get woke. God bless you. Get woke. Folks, MIP is now COVID free, meaning free to all subscribers as we navigate this pandemic. We're thinking about everyone and we've got to get through this together. So for a limited time, no fee to subscribe to make it plain on your favorite podcast app. Ladies and gentlemen, a very special guest with us today he is the barbara jordan chair that says a lot right now (laughs) Uh, right there barbara jordan chair amen in ethics and political values at the lbj school of public affairs and he's a professor of history and the founding director of the center for the study of race and democracy at the university of texas Austin. He is an author of a number of books and writes largely in the genre, thank goodness, of black power. I don't know how many people have exclusively written in that, but he, this brother kind of does that, Um, including Waiting Till the Midnight Midnight Hour and Narrative History of Black Power in America in Dark Days, uh, Bright Nights from Black Power to Barack Obama, uh, again, Stokely, A Life. and he's edited the Black Power Movement, Rethinking the Civil Rights, Black Power Era, and also, and I think this is most applicable today, Neighborhood Rebels, Black Power at the local level. We are happy to have with us Professor Peniel Joseph. My brother, glad to have you, man. How are you? I'm good, thank you for having me. It, it, so his latest book, we should, and this is what we really want to get into, and, and something that I think is also quite applicable today. The, just came out, y'all. The Sword and the Shield, The Revolutionary Lives of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Professor, let's start this way and, and make this somewhat of a teachable moment, because I think uh, even our, a lot of young people need to hear our conversation today. What do you think Malcolm X and Dr. King would be doing right now in response to Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Sean Reed, George Floyd, Central Park? What would they, how would they react? Yeah, I think, I think Mark, thank you for having me on the show. I'm very pleased to be here. I think that Dr. King, Malcolm X, I think they would be organizing. I think what they, the three things they did was organize, educate, and agitate. And I think they would be doing all three of those things. One, I think they wouldn't want any black people to be, um, to experience further harm because we're all experiencing this trauma on different levels. Both of them had experienced racial trauma, especially Malcolm. Malcolm, uh, his father was killed when he was six years old. White supremacists murdered his father. Uh, Malcolm's mother was placed in a psychiatric facility for most of his adult life. So he had experienced trauma. He'd been in jail for 77 months between 1946 and 1952. So really there's no other black leader we've ever had who was more intimately connected with both those who've been incarcerated and who are are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated. So he didn't just talk about that, he lived it. Um, I think he would be organizing on behalf of what I call radical black dignity. Dr. King would be organizing on behalf of radical black citizenship, but they would be organizing together to try to transform these structures of violence and these structures of racism and white supremacy that are making this happen, you know? And we need that organizing at the granular level. Uh, The movement for Black Lives, Black Lives Matter, has tried to do that organizing. And this goes from, Mark, everything from trying to get progressive district attorneys to end the cash bail, money bail system, to really, when we think about people like Angela Davis talking about ending incarceration and prison abolition, this idea that we actually need less cops. We need less cops. And some people might say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, we never had this many cops before. 1970, we had 300,000 people in prison. We have 2.3 million people in prison now. 
and another six, seven, eight million who are connected to probation, parole, some kind of surveillance in the United States. That's over 10 million people, and you need a large workforce to supervise and surveil those people. So what's going on now, and Malcolm and Martin knew this in their time too, is that black bodies are constantly super exploited. So when you think about, people talk about racial privilege, white supremacy, uh, white fragility, white innocence, all these different things. Well, how does it really work? Well, the way it works is this. Every black baby born in the country has a value. It just means that the value, what happens with black people is that the value is not accrued to that person. Meaning that your life has value, even if you're homeless. And I don't mean just the spiritual value and that soul value that you have. I'm saying a monetary value in a capitalist society. And so all the people, when you see George Floyd being killed and murdered right there in the street, when you see Corinne Gaines, Sandra Bland, all these people, Ahmaud Arbery, they have value. It's just that they don't accrue the value. The monetary value is in the specter of black fear. When you see Amy Cooper trying to call the cops on Chris Cooper uh, in, in Central Park because he tells her to, hey, leash up your dog while he's bird watching, right? So what Dr. King understood when he says at the March on Washington, now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. And he says, we come here to cash a check, a check that has been stamped insufficient funds, but we refuse to believe that the Bank of American Justice is bankrupt. That's what Dr. King says in 63. When Malcolm says at the Oxford Union debate in 1964, he wants to align with anyone who's going to change the miserable condition on this earth, on the face of this earth, they're talking about right now. It's not just 63 and 64, and it's right now. And so what they tried to do was build a power base that was big enough, that was large enough, that you could actually have Black dignity, that you could have Black citizenship. Have we um, succeeded? No, we have not. But what we do, one of the big problems that we face today in 2020 is that we lie to ourselves. We converge with American exceptionalism by saying, because Barack Obama was elected president twice, because we have the brilliance of Michelle Obama, Becoming, and I've had an opportunity to meet uh, First Lady Michelle Obama. All these things that I think are very proud and positive things, we act like that success means we've all succeeded. And it's not true. Malcolm X argued that Black people were not citizens of the United States in, 19, in the 1950s and 1960s. That argument holds true today, right? Just because you have some Black success, you've got Beyonce, Jay Z, Oprah Winfrey. It doesn't mean that all of us are citizens. So what you're seeing in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, not just the, the death of, of George Floyd, but the racial segregation, um, the politics of punishment, the way the criminal justice system treats Black people, but also the way it interfaces with public school systems, the way it interfaces with public spaces, including parks and projects where Black people live, the way it interfaces with all these aspects of our lives proves that black people are not citizens. Yeah, yeah. You you said though, the key word you said uh, in invoking Kwame Ture, uh, your other subject in your other book, you said they would be organizing. Um, so you mean not simply seeking uh, likes, follows, clicks, and shares on social media. Absolutely. They would be organizing. And, you know, the social media, here's the thing I'd say, Mark, social media is positive in this sense about <clears throat> educating and raising consciousness. It can be even positive about mobilizing, but we need to organize. And organizing is a couple of things. Organizing is one, you make sure where you're at locally that you've got Black people and allies who are aware of the injustice and the disparities and the oppression that's happening and have resources to combat that at the local level, at the local level. So that means at the neighborhood level, where you are at, whether right. you're connected to a church, a university, um, a boys club, a girls club, whatever you're doing, you make sure and that your organizing might be you're trying to do literacy and reading. Your organizing might be food justice and food security and making sure black kids who are in environmentally toxic zones have access to asthma medicine or diabetes medicine, right? So it's organizing, you, you, you get in where you fit in. That's what we used to say growing up. Yeah, so yeah. It's organizing at the local level. And that means criminal justice systems at the local level. That right. means 
Um, when you think about black businesses, our, our entrepreneurs having access to capital at the local level. Mm -hmm. That means our children and our, our elders having access to childcare, adult care. That means um, schools that are really like bucolic campuses, like what LeBron James just set up, the private, that public academy that's like a private school in Akron, his hometown. Schools that are campuses, they have mental health, they have the, a nutritionist, they have um, job opportunities for parents and people who are in the neighborhood, right? right? So we need to do that. Now at the national level, we have to hold ourselves accountable. We have to admit that the Voting Rights Act was nullified in 2013 by the Robert Supreme Court. I've been telling people this, that we don't tell the truth. It's not just about pre-clearance, it was nullified, which is why you have all this voter ID and this voter suppression, while we have Reverend William Barber doing Moral Mondays in North Carolina, Right. why a movement for black lives is there. So we have to acknowledge, and this is, and you know the brother I'm about to mention, this is what Emil Carr Cabral told us when we think about Cape Bird, Guinea Bissau, the revolutionary hero of the PAIGC. He said, tell no lies and claim no easy victories. That's how you have a revolution. One, you tell the truth, and that's what Martin Malcolm, Emil Carr Cabral, who was assassinated by the Portuguese colonialists, he said, tell no lies and claim no easy victories. We have claimed the civil rights movement as a victory. We claim Rosa Parks, Dr. King, Barack, and Michelle Obama as this victory, and it's an untrue victory. It's an unearned victory, right? Mm -hmm. Because if it's true that we had the citizenship, all the problems that we're facing now, Mark, would be on us. We'd be like, it's our own bad behavior. Our kids are wearing baggy pants. Our young girls have, have children too early. We're, we, we blame ourselves, that kind, of, that kind of psychological punishment, when the problem really is not black behavior, it's white supremacy and structures of racial terror and violence that are attacking us on the daily. Yeah, no, there's so much in, in that very response, brother. I, I, I wanna lift up something though. So in the book, you write about in The Sword and the Shield, the revolutionary lives of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. folks, please get it. Um, <laughs> Because we're going to talk about yeah we're going to talk about this uh, this intersection uh, on in that in that regard. Um, you cite an instance where um, Martin was here in New York and there had been a an episode of police violence that he got involved in and I think Malcolm was out of New York at the moment traveling. Yes. But I was reading that and and thinking well now this what would have happened in fact if they were here in this very situation. So I think we kind of got a glimpse of that, didn't we? Tell us that story, if you would. Yeah, this is the Harlem riots, the Harlem rebellion. Uh, the white folks call it riots, but it was a rebellion. Um, police officer um, Thomas Gilligan murders a 15-year-old boy, a black boy in Harlem. Um, that sparks off um, really days of rioting uh, in, in, in June, July of, of, of 1964. And Malcolm is traveling. Malcolm is on his way to Cairo when, when Harlem pops off. And King is called in by the mayor to try to calm things down. And King not only tries to end the violence because he doesn't want more black people shot, but King says that we need um, civilian review of the entire police because King talks to black people in Harlem at the grassroots and the grassroots say, you know what, we, these, these killer cops have been running wild here for decades, right? And we have the work of Khalil Muhammad, the condemnation of blackness that shows us killer cops in Boston, in, 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 in Philadelphia, in New York, even in the early 20th century, um, killing and murdering black people, Chicago, the whole nine. So King tries to get um, a civilian review of the police and the mayor and the police chief tell him to get out of town. And these are the same folks that Malcolm had been dealing with since the 1950s, because Malcolm, and I say this in the book, we think about Malcolm as only becoming this national figure in 1959 because of the Mike Wallace documentary with Louis Lomax, The Hate That Hate Produced. But Malcolm was black famous in the parlance of young people. He was black famous way before that. We have people, as you know, you're one of them, people who are black famous that the white folks might not know of. But the <laughs> black people know who they are, right? right? The black right. people know who you are, but white folks might say, who's that? Because they only know people who get into the national white mainstream spotlight. So Malcolm was black famous way before white people discovered him in 1959. And the problem of police brutality and the fact that civilians, black civilians don't have control of the police 
is is the tip of the iceberg of what we're seeing in Minneapolis right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, at the outset too, Malcolm would have been organizing for dignity. Yeah. Martin would have been organizing for citizenship. Uh, and, and I know the, the premise is that those two, had they lived, would have come together. Yeah, but and they were coming together. They definitely they were. were. Yeah. So, so help us understand uh, whatever comparison and contrast exists between organizing for dignity and organizing for citizenship. Yeah, that's a great question, Mark. Um, when Malcolm talks about Black dignity, what he means is this idea of Black humanity that does not require white acknowledgement. From politicians, from legal democratic institutions and structures, he's saying he recognizes Black humanity, whether it's in Harlem or Haiti or Africa, and we should mobilize to, make, to give ourselves a power base where that gets recognized without having to negotiate with uh, white racists or imperialists or, or white supremacists. That's what Malcolm is talking about by Black dignity. So for him, it's, it's the dignity connected to not only Black folks in the United States, but Africa. When we think about Malcolm's biggest legacy, it was transforming Negroes into Black people. Not yeah. just African American, but Black people, because that's a better term, because diasporically, we're either African or Black. That's who we are, right? And so that's what Malcolm is talking about in terms of dignity. So, and before getting to citizenship, Malcolm also serves as our prosecuting attorney. And this is very, very important. Hmm. Malcolm, Malcolm charges white America, Mark, with a series of crimes against black humanity. And I'll say that again. He charges white America with a series of crimes against black humanity that start with racial slavery and continue to his present and our present. So that's what Malcolm's doing, which is why he makes so many people uncomfortable. Malcolm is saying racial slavery was wrong. Malcolm is talking about how racial slavery brainwashed some black people, which is why he uses the, that, that, that house Negro versus field Negro. And we still have house Negroes running around today. He says house Negroes identify with white masters and they identify with racial slavery, and they want a piece of the pie of this very oppressive, dehumanizing situation. He makes the claim that field Negroes, like himself, are Black people who he calls, uh, he describes as catching hell every day, right? And that's why Malcolm very famously says that if you've got a knife in my back 11 inches and you move it out six inches, I don't call that process, progress. Mm -hmm. That's what he says, right? So that's what he means by dignity. Citizenship. Um, King is making an argument that citizenship is not just voting rights and not just the end of racial segregation. King is the defense attorney. King is making this argument that America needs and requires mass reform. But he says that citizenship should include a living wage. Citizenship should include decent housing. It should include racial integration of public schools and neighborhoods. So there's shared resources and there's shared sacrifice on the way to citizenship. So when we think about King, King is invested in democratic institutions in the United States because he's saying, look, they have so much power within control or control over Black lives and impact on Black lives. I think by 1963, 64, Malcolm comes to the conclusion that you need both Black dignity and citizenship. I think by 65, 66, King sees you need both citizenship and dignity. Yeah. And, and King, King is never as radical and as robust and as bold a critic of white supremacy as, as un, until Malcolm X is assassinated. Yeah. That's when, when Dr. King is a man on fire after Malcolm X is assassinated. He's saying that the halls of Congress are running wild with racism. He's not on speaking terms with Lyndon Johnson anymore. He's saying that the biggest problem, he says a speech, September of 67, to the American Psychological Association. He says the biggest problem in America is white racism. And white racism produces violence and chaos. And then white denial says that there would be peace and justice if not for the chaos that the white folks themselves are producing. That's Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the influence of Malcolm X though, that people don't talk about, that I talk about in The Sword and the Shield. And, and you know, unfortunately every year we, we get the one speech of Dr. King. We don't get that speech you just described. You know, no. I, I push that one. And I'm telling you another one I, I move on, brother. And I know you write about this too. 
the one at the end of the march to Montgomery. Oh yeah, which That's is brutal. definitely applicable. Yes. about how yes. white folks are fed that psychological bird. Absolutely, that Trump is feeding now. And I'm yes. gonna tell you, I put that out to a white audience and tripped them out. You know, and they thought I was God. They were like, well, that's what it's not me, that's Dr. King's word. But that's they had it. never heard that before. That's March 25th, 1965. Right. That's March right. 25th, 1965. And that's Dr. King. But you know what's interesting, Mark? That's the second and last speech of Dr. King's that was nationally televised. The two speeches are the March on Washington. August 28th, 1963, and that mm -hmm. Selma speech, March 25th, 1965. Yeah. The, that was nationally televised, yeah. yeah. And he, he calls them out on white supremacy, white privilege, white fragility, and how it's destroying American democracy and destroying our society. And that connects to George Floyd too. But one thing that we have to understand, and I think Malcolm understood this still more than Martin, is that the, the rights that white people enjoy um, and the privileges are predicated on the consistent super exploitation of black people and the murders of the George Floyds and the death of Corinne Gaines and Sandra Bland. So we have to understand that when we organize too, because there's never been a society in the United States that's not super exploiting black people for the gain of white identity, white citizenship, white wealth. So if we ever move beyond that, we really are in a whole new ball game and people are losing privileges where their identities and their wealth and their access isn't based on black premature death and marginalization. My kid having asthma, my kid not getting access to clean water, being connected to asbestos, being on parole, probation, having worse health out, healthcare outcome, outcomes, black women making over $200,000 a year have terrible rates of infant death and infant mortality. As we've seen with Serena Williams had to have two life-saving surgeries and she's this hundred millionaire because the medical industry treats black women and black men as, as, as subjects and objects of derision, not as human beings. And that's what Malcolm and Martin both understood that we were not being treated as human beings by not only these institutions, but these institutions are connected to what people. So the cops, that murdered George Floyd, these are people, they represent institutions, but we need to transform these institutions. And if you do that, then you can change the hearts and minds. It doesn't happen the other way around. It's yeah. not changing the hearts and minds and then the institutions. You've got to take control of the institutions through anti-racist policies and, 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 and organizing to make sure that this kind of black death can never happen again. I, I like that that contrast too Ma that you said. Malcolm was a prosecuting attorney, absolutely, and Martin was a defense attorney, absolutely. And Ma Ma Martin defends black people to white people, but he also defends white people to black people because people don't understand both sides needed that talking to. He tells whites that black people, and he tries to assuage. It's not so much as white guilt. He tries to assuage white fear of losing the racial advantage and the racial tax that they've gained ever since racial slavery. That's what he's trying to do. So people talk about white guilt. White folks don't have guilt. White folks have fear of losing the advantage that they have. Some, sometimes when we think about living in a patriarchal society, men, especially white men, have real fear about losing patriarchy and saying, well, what if this board was just filled with women and I don't have the same access that I used to have before, right? And so this whole racial, it's a racial fear of saying that the way in which getting into Harvard, getting into Yale, you're getting that because of not just the super exclusion of black folks, but the super exploitation of black folks. That's how all, all these people who built up private equity firms, who built up hedge funds, who built up generational wealth in Silicon Valley. It's not just through technological innovation. You're not president at a school like Harvard or the University of Texas where I teach because you are so good. You're president because of white supremacy as well as the advantage from the dehumanization and the super exploitation of black and brown people who are not even part of the competition to get that presidency. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Your kids can go to that private school, not just because my kids are left out, it's because they're making sure that my kid never is gonna have that opportunity. My kid's going to jail while your kid's going to private school. And those two things are connected. That's what we don't ever talk about. 
right? And I yep. think a movement for black lives have, and when you get down to that granular level, that's when you know you have to change the entire edifice of this political system. Yeah, no question about it. So in terms of them being on a trajectory that inevitably would have brought them together, do you find, did you find any hints or signals that that was inevitable in their early lives and careers? Not, you know, not in the early, I'd say my biggest hints about King and Malcolm coming together, about Malcolm and Martin, I think it's really in the last year of their lives, in last year of, of Malcolm's life, in, in this sense. I disagree with the idea that Malcolm has an epiphany on the Hodge and then suddenly is cool with white people and that stuff. Right. I think that's just nonsense. And I think I show that in the book that Malcolm always understood and had a complex relationship with white people. He was willing to get white allies and some white funding, socialist workers parties, others, but, but didn't necessarily think a bunch of them were gonna be sincere, had met white Muslims in 1959 when he first went to the Middle East. So the idea that suddenly, because he's in Mecca, he has the, he, but he knew that white media needed a new origin story, which is why he sent out dozens of postcards to James Farmer and other people and his newspaper reporter friends and leaked the new story so he could have a different image. Uh, but M M Malcolm and Martin meet on March 26, 1964 at the U.S. Senate. Then Malcolm um, uh, hears him speak December 17th, and then Malcolm goes to Selma February 3rd, 4th, 5th, 1965. He meets up with Coretta Scott King. Those are the three things that really show you. Because one, the meeting. The only time they met, just for a few minutes, they're both coming to the U.S. Senate while the, civil, while the Senate is uh, filibustering, meaning debating the Civil Rights Act of 64 that's going to be passed July 2nd. And that act is the one that ended uh, racial segregation on public accommodations. But it's also an act that snuck in the fact that um, women would be a protected class, too. So when you think about the 64 Civil Rights Act, that's why you have college female sports. The reason why UT has a women's soccer team and volleyball team and swimming is because women then sued and said, hey, equal protection under this act, and they've won. So when you think about um, them meeting, they're both coming to the Senate as lobbyists, right? They both meet as, they're both holding press conferences. Malcolm says he supports the Civil Rights Act, but he says if it's, if it's enforced, there's going to be a civil war in the South and a race war in the North, right? Because he says that the equality really can't be enforced because white supremacy is based on the degradation and the denigration of Black people. Because that's what we're seeing. When people talk about sitting in, or freedom rise, these are all symbols of denigration and degradation that are connected to wealth, that are connected to value, that are connected to racial slavery. A lot of times people don't understand why are these things happening? And the larger structure of this is, yeah, wealth, inequality, and power, but there's also something symbolic about saying, look at all those poor Black people. And even the death and the murder of George Floyd is very symbolically used. When we show that on Twitter and social media a bunch of times, it's very, very negative. And you know that. It's showing this scene of lynching that, that it, doesn't, it doesn't humanize him. It makes us all less human. You know, mm -hmm. death is sacred. Even somebody who's being murdered is sacred, right? You, you can't show that unless you ask permission from his family. Just like Emmett Till, we see the open casket. It is his mama who gave us permission to see that. She said in 55, let me see, let the world see what they've done to my boy. 14 years old and he's castrated, he's, he's, he's murdered and lynched. His body is found in the Tallahatchie River, a 125 pound cotton gin fan belt tied around his neck. That's Emmett Till before Trayvon Martin. So we shouldn't show the George Floyd thing and all these white people who are watching it on social media. It's completely racist and very disrespectful, even those who are crying crocodile tears about his death, right? Because death is sacred and black death should be sacred as much as white death. We don't see a bunch of white people who black people have snapped their necks and it's on TV and it's been viewed 5 million times. There's no, there's no corollary to this. Yeah. So when, when we think of- when it, we think it, becomes, of, it becomes pornography. It becomes pornography, yeah. So when we think about Malcolm, those three meetings show you that they were absolutely converging. Um, when he tells Coretta Scott King uh, that he's here to help her husband, who's been arrested in Selma, and he says, tell Dr. King I admire him, and I'm not here to hurt. I'm here to help the movement, because I want the white folks to know 
that if they don't do what Dr. King wants, which is voting rights, there's going to be another alternative. So I think that Clarence Jones, who was Dr. King's attorney, he met with Malcolm X. Um, Juanita Portier, people don't talk about this, Sidney Portier's first wife was super, super radical. She lets them use their home. Um, Sidney is more of a, you know, civil rights, <laughs> nonviolent guy. His first wife, um, um, Juanita, was, was, was very, very radical. She's an ally of Malcolm X's too. So I think that post-Voting Rights Act, they absolutely would have gotten together because post-Voting Rights Act, as I show, once Dr. King goes to Watts and sees that Watts, the uprising happens five days after the Voting Rights Act, he understands that white supremacy can't be stopped just through Civil Rights Act or Voting Rights Act. And it's important for all of us in 2020 to understand that Watts happened this August 11th is gonna be the 55th anniversary of Watts. And that's George Floyd, Corinne Gaines, Sandra Bland, uh, Renika Boyd all over again. Because what's going on is this, the number one interface with us is the criminal justice system going back to racial slavery and going back to right after the Civil War, convict lease system. Um, there's a book, Slavery by Another Name, that won the Pulitzer Prize, that looks at the hundreds of thousands of us who were in the convict lease system, who were just snatched up, um, spent you know an average of seven years it took to die, just being worked to death in mines in Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, coal mine, the whole steel mills, just, just snatched up for vagrancy, and, and, and money bail system that starts the system of mass incarceration. And there were black women who were snatched up to help pave roads in Atlanta and other places. So Watts happens because police are saying this black man was um, a car thief. And one thing that you can't ever believe is the cops. So just because some uh, of the cops say that this black boy, we didn't have video in that age, was stealing a car, we're not expected to believe that, although I think some Black people do believe it, right? Because just like George Floyd, if we didn't see this video, they would have said he was resisting arrest, yeah. right? They would have said he was resisting arrest. So it's important for us to understand that the number one interface between white supremacy and Black bodies right now is the criminal justice system. But it's the criminal justice system connected to all these other institutions. It's connected to your neighborhood space. It's connected to public schools. It's connected to um, how, how our kids eat. It's connected to the environment. It's, it's the criminalization of the entire, or what I'll say is the criminalization of entire Black communities who live in specific zip codes. So they don't live in the Blackish zip code. You see what I'm saying? So there's, there's Black people who are in bubbles protected until a cop might stop them, right? Because remember, Johnny Cochran was an ADA, assistant district attorney in Beverly Hills, and he was stopped by the cop. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that, that's that's clear. Um, you you mentioned Selma. Yes. So uh, I'm on the board of of the Jubilee in Selma, the only civil rights commit uh, uh, event that's commemorated every year. Oh wow, that's awesome. <laughs> Over ten years ago, we were all in Selma as usual, and and Selma, as you probably know, kind of is is organic and organizes itself. If you haven't been to one of the Jubilees, I want to invite you because... I've been to Selma, but I haven't been to the Jubilees. Jubilee. I've done research in Selma, Montgomery. Yeah, we have to get you there. All over, all over Alabama, love it. Because folk just come together organically and it's yeah. very down to earth and, and you, you run into icons and spend time with icons. And so me and Dick Gregor and some other folk were there. It's been about a decade ago. Wow. More, maybe more, because we at that time we weren't recording on camera phones and all that. So it was before then. An elderly gentleman comes up to a group of us and to tell a story. And he says he was one of the people who was tending to Malcolm when he visited Selma. Wow. wow. Now you are a researcher and a PhD, so someone like you would have had to research this and corroborate, but I'm just gonna tell you the story he told us. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, and left us all riveted. And we haven't seen him since he, he probably passed away. His story is that when Malcolm finished speaking, and I believe Dr. King was in jail in Birmingham or wherever, he, Malcolm asked him to drive him to see Dr. King in jail. Yeah, I believe that. The, 
when they got there, the jailers wouldn't let Malcolm in. Yeah, that, that's what I've heard too. You've heard it. I've, and so, I've heard and, that. I think Dr. King was in Selma, Mark. I think he was in Selma jail. I'm not sure where he was. It was it was unclear. Okay. Yeah, I think he was in summer. But the the gentleman alleged that there was a conversation that they said you can talk to him through the window. And I mean, you we hear people. You guess what? He must be telling the truth because he had a lot of detail. He said that Malcolm went around to a window where Dr. King's cell was, and that they stacked some because the the window was up higher, taller than Malcolm was and that they stacked some bricks on the ground so Malcolm could step on the bricks and see into the window and talk to Dr. King. Wow, I've never heard that. Right, and, and what he said to us was that in that conversation, they agreed that when Dr. King got out of jail, that they would sit down and talk and further go forward on yeah. picking up where Marcus Garvey left off and going to the UN. Yeah. yeah. And so, whether that story is completely factual or not. Yeah. And to the extent that yours still paints the picture of, of, a, of somewhat of a meeting point in Selma. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. It is my hypothesis that that is why the plan to assassinate Malcolm was probably pushed up. Oh, and absolutely. it happened within two weeks. Yeah, no, it happens within two weeks. Yeah, he's, he's assassinated February 21st. And I absolutely think they were going to get together. They absolutely were going to. And the plan to go to the United Nations was definitely um, um, Malcolm carrying out what Black folks have been trying to do in the 1940s, the We Charge genocide pamphlet. This is the Paul Robeson, Lorraine Hansberry Council on African right. Affairs. Right. Boys, Alphaeus Hunton. That, that, that group of, of black radicals and internationalists, right? And so um, I, I absolutely think, especially post voting rights, and if Malcolm had been alive just through 65 with Watts, um, King would have gotten it. And certainly Malcolm would have gone to LA, you know what I mean? You, you know, yeah. uh, if, if, cause Malcolm, one thing that his advisors had wanted him to do was um, go overseas and just, just wait it out a little bit. And if he had done that, Certainly with Watts, he would have been able to come back and been a very, very um, significant, significant figure. So which uh, had the greater influence on the other? Did one, or did one have more influence on the other, do you think? You know, I, you know I, I think they both serve as each other's alter egos. I think on some levels we can see on some levels a clearer, bigger impact for a longer time on Dr. King um, from Malcolm than the other way around on some levels, you know, because King lives another three years and King starts talking about black pride. He starts talking about black is beautiful. I mean, come on, that's Malcolm X. I mean, yeah. King, King starts giving white people um, and white racism and white supremacy such hell in a way that is so distinct from before that you've got to say that that's the impact. Certainly Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael and the black power movement but it's really, it's really Malcolm. It's really Malcolm is who he's, he's talking about. Even when he doesn't mention Malcolm, Malcolm's right there um, in the room with him speaking truth to power. And certainly by the time he's doing the poor people's campaign, the idea of massive civil disobedience. And even in Memphis, like the day before King's assassinated, that evening, he says that in Birmingham, we didn't let fire hoses and dogs turn us around. But here's the, the line that people don't talk about, and I, and I do. He says, tomorrow, he says, he says we're not going to let any illegal injunction turn us around. Mm -hmm. So this is a different king. <laughs> king had always followed the law. Yeah. So when people had injunctions, King would even tell his supporters, hey, we got to go to court. We got to go to court, and then we can march, right? By uh, turn, turn, around, turn around Tuesday and sell. Yeah, turn around Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that that you know that's March seventh, uh, nineteen sixty five. So no, King is saying we're we're not going to let any illegal injunction turn us around. So at that point, he's saying, look, he's like, this is illegal, and you're like, well, did the lawyers tell you, Doctor King? He said, <laughs> well, I'm saying it's illegal. <laughs> Right. I'm saying yeah, it's clear. I hadn't even thought about it. That's a good yeah, point. I've heard said, it a thousand times, but you're right. He said, yeah. He said we're not letting any illegal injunction <laughs> turn us around. So at that point, you're like, well, damn, you know, damn. I mean, this is this is you, this is you. And he's like, Yeah, this is me. And Look, you're like, Well, all right, Reverend, let's go, let's march. Let's march. I, I knew I I was blessed also to know Jim Foreman. 
Oh yeah, These and are- and he used to talk him and one brother who's uh, 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 still with us, uh, uh, Willie Ricks, and they oh, got yeah. together after uh-huh. Turnaround Tuesday, and they wore they told me to stay wore Dr. King oh, yeah, out. Yeah. They say they call him Uncle Tom and everything, but they also both told me this. That was the beauty of Dr. King. His his feelings weren't hurt that way. Yeah. And he still kept them nearby. So now I still need y'all with me. He had a really tough skin. They called him every uncle, all the way back to the to Brown. They said, Mark, we called him every Uncle Tom you could think of. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, all right, it's, it's cool. But this we got it. And, and in the end, in that particular situation, because he said, listen, y'all, they were going to shoot us all that day. He said he okay. felt it. Yeah. We were going to all get shot down yeah. like yeah. dogs. But but that was 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 one of one of his things, and and they could say that to him, and yet he still stood with those brothers and kept them them near him. Yeah, and, and I think Dr. King influences Malcolm in terms of Malcolm becoming even um, a, a, a bigger diplomat than he was, because I think Malcolm one of the mistakes that people think about Malcolm X is that Malcolm is a negotiator; he's a diplomat. You know, yeah. um, he's somebody who's interested in ideas and interested in bringing people together. He's just a truth teller on top of that. So I think that looking at King, uh, Malcolm does have not jealousy, but there's some aspect of of seeing how King is able to mobilize people right. and right. wanting to mobilize people on that score too. I mean, Malcolm has a famous quip after King wins, Dr. King wins the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and the, the journalist asks him what he thinks, and he says he would never accept the Peace Prize in a time of war, right? You know, <laughs> but, but but he also says in one of his last interviews that. You know, Dr. King has a Nobel Prize, but I can go to all these places in Africa, the Middle East, these universities, meet with people. And and my my reward is that, you know, the people believe in me at the grassroots. You know what I mean? So you're never going to get a Nobel Prize if you're Malcolm X, because the kind of truths you're telling are very unsettling, disruptive truths, right? Yeah. I think that looking at King, and I think it really starts in Birmingham and seeing what King is doing, even as he's saying, He's an Uncle Tom, and you shouldn't have put women and children on the line. And I push back against that and show you the complexity and the power of nonviolence, too. Mm-hmm. But, but, and even when he says it's a farce on Washington, he's impressed by what King is doing. And he even says, they had reporters say, um, did you like the speech? And he says, yeah, I was moved by King's speech, but, and then he starts yeah. to, you see yeah. what I'm So he listened uh, to me, what I've seen on record, what I found, and, and, and people could find more evidence, but the two speeches that I know Malcolm X listened to of Martin Luther King Jr. One, Manning Marable says he was at the hotel room probably watching the March on Washington and listening to the speech, but he's certainly at the hotel the day before, the eve before, and he's around DC during the March on Washington because he had been in DC at least since March of 63 as a temporary head of Muslim Mosque number four. There's a great picture of Malcolm giving a press conference March 16th 1963. So he's there that entire summer, right? Mm. And, and the second time is the December 17th speech because Andy Young, the great Andy Young, talks about it even in his biography. And Andy and his family, they knew Malcolm. They mm. knew Malcolm. So Malcolm is sitting next to him for the whole King speech, you know? So Malcolm is, is a, aware of King's oratorical power. They're, they're, they are both part of the Black church's call and response. Even as Malcolm is a Muslim, his father was an itinerant Baptist church. So we all know when we hear Malcolm, we're hearing a street speaker, but we're hearing a Baptist preacher, but not a Baptist preacher in the same vein as King. King went to Morehouse, Crozier Theological Seminary in Boston University. Malcolm got a PhD in prison, and Malcolm was on the streets of Harlem in the 1940s selling weed to jazz musicians. Yeah. So everyone knew who Malcolm was. In fact, by the time he becomes Malcolm X, and he walks out of prison, um, goes to the Turkish bath and, 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 and cleans himself, August 7th, 1952. When he comes back to Harlem in 1954, Mark, people know who he is because they remember him as Detroit Red. <laughs> they know who he is. Right. They, right. I mean, he was a Pullman car porter. He was a hustler. He was an entertainer. He was doing all this, this yeah. stuff. And now he's this Muslim. And initially, people are trying to figure out, hey, is this real? And then they see, well, it's as real as a heart attack. It's realer than real, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and so, so Malcolm is influenced by King. And you see this when Malcolm becomes the biggest statesman is when he becomes so, he, so, he was always gentle, like James Baldwin says. But with the press in 64, 
people are asking him, and even in France, they're asking him about interracial relationships and he's saying love is love. He's getting a bigger, bigger um, um, paradigm. He has a bigger framework. He sees himself as this human rights revolutionary. You know, He never gives up the fact that indigenous people have the right to self-determination and that might include self-defense of violence against white supremacy. He never gives that up, but he also starts saying that, hey, he's willing to craft alliances with people who are politically sincere. You yeah. know, that, yeah. that, that's what, so his whole thing is human rights, but again, he's an unfailing truth teller. So when you're an unfailing truth teller, most of the time heads of states don't want anything to do with you, right? Because you're pushing back against American exceptionalism. So I think Martin influences him in, in thinking about the, 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 the bigger uh, transnational um, capacities for black liberation. That, yeah. That's how Martin, uh, but, but, but I think they both influence each other to understand that you need black dignity, radical black dignity, and you need radical black citizenship. It's got to go hand in hand in service of human rights. So, so lastly, did you detect that Malcolm, because I always got the impression that he, he was also itching, even when he was under the honorable Elijah Muhammad to kind of get out there and do what King was doing. In other words, to engage, even though there were points of disagreement, it seemed like he would have loved to be, get out there and, and, and mix it up too. Uh, and obviously he, he probably would not have abided by the principles of nonviolence and turn the other cheek. But I, you know, I, it seems as if he wanted to get out there on the front line somehow. Am I wrong about that? No, you're absolutely right, brother. He did, he wanted to, and I'd say that he did. I think sometimes we've said that you know, and Jackie Robinson critiqued him and said, Malcolm is uh, radical in Harlem where it's easy to be radical. <laughs> Malcolm is at demonstrations in Washington, D.C. Malcolm is at union demonstrations connected to 1199 SCIU, which is my mother's union and, and, and gr growing up here in New York City. Um, Malcolm is actually, a lot of times, here, here's, here's the rub. Malcolm often, and this is part of why he's kicked out, defies the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad allows this to happen. Why? Malcolm is making them millions of dollars. So Malcolm is a money machine for a time. Elijah Muhammad, basically what he does is replace Malcolm X with Muhammad Ali. Mm. That's what he does. He replaces Malcolm X with Muhammad Ali. Cassius Clay had been drawn to the Nation of Islam because of Malcolm X have been connected to it since 1962. Honorable Elijah Muhammad has, wants nothing to do with Cassius Clay until he does what? Wins the heavyweight championship. Once he wins the heavyweight championship, Malcolm, who's been silenced for 90 days, is trying to leverage Cassius Clay to get back into the Nation of Islam. What the Honorable Elijah Muhammad does is give Cassius Clay the name Muhammad Ali, and Muhammad Ali comes running into the Nation of Islam. The, the friendship and brotherhood with Malcolm X who had raised them from a pup is over. Something Ali regrets and says on record that he regrets, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that's what, that's what happens to, to Malcolm X. So Malcolm X, between 19, when he joins the Nation of Islam in prison, there's only several hundred hardcore dues-paying uh, Muslims. By the time he is kicked out of the group, you can have any estimates from 25,000 to 50,000 or more who are hardcore Muslims. Mm. He's the person who does that. He does it in service to Elijah Muhammad, but also does it in service to these secular radical politics that he has. So he's constantly defying until the defiance becomes too much. And, and it, they really don't, Mal Malcolm X is messing with their status as a nonprofit and tax exempt. They're getting letters about that. Uh, Malcolm, is, is criticizing what the, the, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad with th th certain things that have happened in his personal life, right, uh, right. certain things that are happening um, with financially in the organization. All these different things come to a head and Malcolm is kicked out. The chickens coming home to roost comment is just used as an excuse to silence Malcolm X. That's all yeah. that that is. It's an excuse and that's it. Yeah. And he walked right into it because he did want to be free from that. He did want to be free from the Nation of Islam, what he called a straitjacket. He wanted to be free. So you're saying he kind of knew what he was doing when he said Yeah, that. subconsciously okay. he wanted to, you know, it's a big price, it becomes a bigger price because I think there are times 
in the initial aftermath of the 90 day suspension, Elijah Muhammad had been a father figure where you want to apologize and come back. And at that point, people around Elijah Muhammad, including the FBI, made sure that that wasn't going to happen. You know, and it's interesting, you talk about the relationship between Muhammad Ali and, and, and Malcolm X and, and how those things unfold. I mean, that's the story of all human history, isn't it? I mean, people having conflicts, conflicts, the personality issues, the jealousies, the egos, moving one person out, the disciple outgrows the teacher. Um, I mean, it's, it, it's all very real. And, uh, and, and you've put it out there. Brother, this, uh, um, I could do this for hours. Do, do, you, do, you, do you teach, do your, are your classes like this? Oh, yeah, absolutely. This is what we do. We do it with, the, we do it with all, what's interesting about being able to teach about Black power and think about Black power uh, from you know, the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries that you get Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells, uh, Marcus Garvey, uh, Lorraine Hansberry, Angela Davis, you get it all. Um, and, and just the, the, the different streams of our movement is, is uh, very exciting, you know? Yeah. Solidarity, I've got the new book, Sandy's new book on black reparations. And I'm gonna teach that for my uh, graduate seminar on African-American intellectual history, along with the sword and the shield. I mean, so it's definitely a, a really good, our, our history is so, so important, um, but also just so fascinating. And, and we, we have a dope history in terms of black people. And I'm, I'm privileged to be able to definitely teach this um, and, and connect it with what's happening in the contemporary uh, era. Brother, we are uh, thankful for your intellect and your scholarship. Folks, check out The Sword and the Shield, The Revolutionary Lives <laughs> Thank you. of Malcolm X and Dr. King. And you really have to, um, you really have to, one has to mature folks in their knowledge of yeah. our history and our struggle. When you do that, you can see the inter intersections. Yeah. Uh, even between, you know, you can go back and see there was conflict, but then toward the end of, of his life, Du Bois was moving closer to Marcus Garvey. And Booker, and Booker T. Washington was, was coming into a different, so we've always had these debates in the public space in terms of our leadership and people but in the end, the conditions right here in this hellhole we call America ultimately lead us all back together and overlap, you know, and, and would you not agree? Absolutely. And Martin and Malcolm, I think right now, uh, and, and Malcolm used to say it's hot as, it's hot as hell in America. He called America a, a searing racial wilderness. And we can, we can all see that. Anybody who has any kind of love for Black people can see that. I'll, I'll say this, Mark. The three things that bind Malcolm and Martin internally, e eternally, is uh, personal sincerity, um, political integrity, and the last one, which is really important, unapologetic love for all Black people. Black yeah. people who were um, non-able-bodied, black, black people who were gay, Black people who were straight, women, um, children, um, poor Black people, people who were incarcerated, people who were addicted to drugs, people who were single moms, they loved black people. Yeah. They didn't just, you know, you've been around for a long time, so you know the people who don't walk the talk, who say it good in a speech, and then when you're seeing them behind closed doors, they are yeah. not embracing our people. They're doing the exact opposite. And so, these, uh, these men are different. So speaking of which, I, so let, let's for a moment, let, let me pretend I'm one of your students and, and, and tell me if, I'm, if I would have put forward this thesis, it would be on, on the right path. Speaking of that unconditional love, uh, and I would simply say that I agree with you, but there, there are types of love. You know, folks have loved or been in love with someone, and it's sincere and it's loving and it's affectionate, and it's cool. You know, it's just kind of even. And then there are others that you love or fall in love with, or they fall in love with you, and it's just full of passion. Yeah. You know, it's just, uh, it's just a lot there. And to me, you know, Martin was kind of the former. It was love, yeah. but, but Malcolm brought the hot sauce with the love. You know, it was a little bit, you know, it was a little bit more to it if you wanted to do something, you know, and uh, so that's kind of where I, where I would, how I would characterize it. You know, I, I'd say that they both had the hot sauce and I'll tell you why. I think that Dr. King, that we, we, when you saw the hot sauce with him is both in places like the Mississippi Delta, the Alabama Black Belt, but I think he gets that passion too when you see him in Chicago with gang members. Yeah. And up till three, four, five o'clock in the morning, where people, Dr. King's own age, are like, why are you talking to these? And they're not even saying Negroes. Why are you talking to these? 
And, and he's saying, you know, I, I love, and they're part of the beloved community. So I'd say that the passion for King definitely grows. And I think Malcolm helps him accelerate and amplify that love, you know, because that's what I'll say King becomes really like one of his biographers says, a pillar of fire those last three years yeah. after Dr. King. So when you think about King as Moses, it's not the early King, it's not March on Washington King. Yeah. The prophetic yeah. King, the King, who, who, and he even said it after he won the Nobel Prize. He's excited about this mountaintop moment, but he knew he'd have to go back in the valley. And he says that, he right. says that. So right. the, the king I most admire is the king who's mired in the valley. He's mired in the valley because that's where we are. We're, we're not exalted yep. on the mountain. We are in the valley, right? And that's the king. And Malcolm was always on, in that valley with us. Absolutely. Malcolm is the, the Black America's working class hero of the 20th century and the 21st century. There's no one. Um, ever, we, we've never produced anyone better than, than Malcolm X. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask your reaction to the, the Netflix documentary on, on Malcolm's death. Yeah, you know, I, I was talking head, so I could say, <laughs> I could preface by saying I was one of the people they asked on camera to That's talk. That's right, they, 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 yes, you did, you sure were. And, and so, no, I thought, it was, I thought it was tremendous. I thought it was a great way to reintroduce Malcolm X to millions of young people who have not seen the Spike Lee film, Malcolm X from 1992, that's going to be 30 years in 2022. So I thought that it was a great series, especially in my mind, the first uh, four episodes showed you so much of the history and his humanity um, in ways that we don't get. So I think the fact that we had six hours of Malcolm X for the first time streaming is very important. And they didn't try to water him down. I think you saw what a radical revolutionary figure Malcolm um, was, and I think a lot of people uh, watch that. And so it becomes a, a form of public consciousness and public history and education. So that's, that's really important because we celebrate Dr. King every day, but we usually don't celebrate, except in the black community. Malcolm X's 95th birthday was May 19th and black people and his, his, his children, and I was part of this too, celebrating him. Right. But there, there's no white <laughs> understanding of how important Malcolm X is. And I think that's one of the reasons I wrote the book, and I'm really happy about that Netflix series as well. Yeah, yeah. Folks, uh, The Sword and the Shield, and an appropriate title as well, The Sword and the Shield, The Prosecuting Attorney and the Defense Attorney, The Revolutionary Lies of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Peniel Joseph, our guest man, uh, congratulations uh, on the book. This is very powerful and important for those in my generation. I mean, you know, Malcolm and Martin were, were really, um, if there is a modern day movement, I mean, they, they were the fathers of that movement. And we don't know, there's, there's never too much we can learn and uncover about them, you know? And uh, I had a good friend of mine that passed away at a young age and he never got past um, Malcolm's era with the nation, you know? And, and he never saw the transition that Dr. King made, the transitions that Malcolm made, the coming together he was still at the place of, of division. And I wish he could have stuck around, read your book and really get a real sense of what was happening. So brother, we thank you and, and congratulations. We will talk again. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much. All thank right, you. brother. God, you are our refuge. Send our ancestors to guard our doors. Cast out this virus from our communities and our bodies. Heal, bless and protect everyone listening and their loved ones. Thank you for listening to Make It Plain and Get Woke. Remember to listen, like, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. If all minds are clear, it has been Made Plain. Made Plain.